Global, thank you for being, for being here for Global Entrepreneurship Week. My name is Stephanie, and I am the president of Anaxis Ryerson, which is hosting this event this, tonight. Anaxis Ryerson is the unofficial entrepreneurship course union here at Ryerson, and we focus on turning your ideas into reality. We do this through creating sustainable initiatives in the communities around us. For example, did you know that we're building a geodesic greenhouse dome in Nunavut to address food insecurity, or starting businesses here in Toronto, or starting microloans in Kenya? And Actus Ryerson really focuses on fostering the culture of entrepreneurship on campus, which is why we have brought you to Startup School. I'd like to introduce next Scott Bowman. Where did he go? Oh, there you are. Scott Bowman from Futurepreneur. He will be talking to you a bit more about Global Entrepreneurship Week. How many have heard about Global Entrepreneurship Week? Wow, just about everybody. That's great. Because we're on the ad, right? So we can come in tonight. Yeah. Great. Well, Global Entrepreneurship Week, I must say, happy at GEW Week. Um, Futurepreneur Canada is, is proud to be the host. This is our seventh year being the official host of Global Entrepreneurship Week. You know, it's an international celebration. Uh, over 10 million people, 140 countries. Uh, 162. 162 countries. It grows every single year. Uh, you know, I don't need to read my messaging better. But 162 countries, 10 million people, and you guys are all part of this, celebrating entrepreneurship. The idea that young people, that people around the world are able to take their ideas and live their dreams and actually create something that creates value, that creates opportunity for themselves and for others in their community and their country. And this is fantastic. I mean, this is an incredible thing. Look, I just came in today from, I was in Peterborough and I was in Belleville. And I met with a number of entrepreneurs in Belleville. I met with somebody that's starting up a plus size uh, bridal store because there isn't one right now in Belleville. And she had to go all the way. She tried Toronto. She tried to, um, dresses in Montreal. She finally got to Ottawa and she found one there. But you know where it's actually being flown in from? Australia. Why? Because there isn't seamstresses that are catering to the plus size market. So she wants to start something on her own here in Belleville. So that was fantastic. And I met with some other uh, folks that were starting up a not-for-profit social venture. And those guys are really excited about teaching young people about the value of, of the environment and of uh, nature and uh, preserving our, our natural habitat, especially when it comes to butterflies. So they want to start a butterfly conservancy. And so they're going to start one of those around the Belleville area in Trent, Trenton. So again, it's, it's, it's living your own ideas and really building that up. And that was at Trenton University. Sorry. Um, and I did tell him I was coming here tonight to Ryerson, so you know, the ground zero when it comes to entrepreneurship schools in, in Canada. They, they boom and threw, threw bugs at me. It was lunch. But uh, I can tell you right now is that they're really envious, and I'm really glad to be here because those guys, I can tell you, they are fighting like mad to get where you guys are and where your campus is and then actually get ahead and become known as an entrepreneurial school. And so that was the, the there was a bunch of business students that are going to be competing here in, in uh, Toronto in January. And so they were doing a whole thing where they're actually fundraising to get down here for a big competition. So they, uh, they're they really, you know, really doing flying the flag for GEW uh, as well there in Peterborough. But yeah, so Future Premier Canada, we're glad to be here. We're glad to be part of this, you know, in this national, international, and, you know, this really global celebration about entrepreneurship and really about helping people understand that their dreams can become reality and that futurepreneur just as a quick plug before i hand it over to sean uh is uh you know futurepreneur has been around for almost 20 years and since that time we've helped over 8500 people across the country start up whether it's through financing mentorship or otherwise so we're really happy to be, be part of this and uh you know and to uh <laughs> and to see sean here but we're really happy to be part of this you know what, before we let you go, I wanted you to talk a little bit about how those who are young entrepreneurs under the age of 39 can engage with Futurepreneur, whether it be through mentorship, through education. It would be a shame to hear about all of your travels and not know what it is that people are engaging you with. For sure. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I keep hearing about, Sean, thanks for the reminder about that. One of the things they say is, is what do I really need to do to get started, right? It's like, I have this great idea. You know, and if you ever had a dream, I hear this a lot when I go talk to people. I say, I have this great business idea, it's like a dream of mine. I can't wait to get it started. If you ever had a dream, you woke up one day and you're like, wow, I can't wait to tell somebody. But then when you went to tell them about it, and then you were like, oh. And then there was something else I can't remember, you know. And then you went on and there was disjointed. A lot of business ideas are like that, where you really have this great passion, you really want to get somebody started, but there's pieces missing. You're like, I'm not sure what we should do. So you know what I talked to them about is we actually created some online free resources to help people actually map out their business idea 
at futurepreneur.ca forward slash resources is a whole slew of uh, free, uh, non-age specific, but for those that are eight, under the age of 39, free resources from a business plan writer that's interactive, that as you plug things into it, it actually pops up with crazy presentations, that actually prompts you with questions, you know, to, to make sure you actually know, you actually learn as you put in information about your business. So if you're putting in something you're not too sure, it'll help prompt you and guide you as you put those in. So I told people about that today, is to really go and use those free services that we've got on that. As well too, there's links to a lot of different other um, organizations and, and experts, content experts, uh, available on that website, the resources page. The other thing too is there's a lot of crash courses. Everything from finding out who is your best customer, right? A lot of young entrepreneurs say, oh my God, I have this great idea. And when I ask them, who is this idea for? Like, who's gonna be your customer? And they're like, everybody, who wouldn't want this? Problem is this, is that not everybody's gonna be your customer, but there is somebody who is your best customer. So we have a lot of online content that talks about finding out who your best customer is. How do you reach your best customer? Through sales and marketing. And how do you make sure that you actually develop a business idea and get launched in a way that is sustainable? Because it's one thing to start a business, but you gotta be able to sustain it, create a profit by offering value. So a lot of these things are actually taught. I know that Sean and the Professor Sierra Ryerson do a great job, but this is just to add on as well as you sort of develop and write out your business ideas. So we've created those free of charge for anybody to use, and I can tell you that as of right now, it's been accessed by over 53,000 people across Canada since we launched this thing in, in December 2013. Once you're actually going through that, and once you've actually developed a little bit of a business idea, and you develop something like a two-year business plan uh, when it comes to the financial side of things, Actually, people submit it. Not everybody, we haven't had 53,000 people submit ideas, but you know what, people do submit us ideas all the time. We go and we vet them. My team of business development people work with people to really answer any outstanding questions and then pass them on to client relationship managers. And that's really the sort of, if people are looking for financing. Because at Futurepreneur Canada, we provide up to $45,000 in a low interest, unsecured, no collateral, no equity loan, uh, available to 18 to 39 year olds. But also on top of that, not only do you get money, you also get a mentor. A volunteer mentor who is there to actually help you become as successful as possible. And I can tell you that we're, my team, we're constantly out there recruiting mentors, looking, you know, looking for the best and brightest. They want to give back to entrepreneurs just like you. They want to get started and be successful. Not just for a little bit, not just for a summer, not just for a year, but for a lifetime. And so, Futurepreneur, I can tell you that our, our mentors um, are integrated in the, you know, the entrepreneurial community. And I know a lot of them actually come from Ryerson. And, uh, and it's really a great opportunity for you guys to actually get financing but mentoring that lasts a lifetime. So that's futurepreneur.ca forward slash resources for all the good stuff you can get from Futurepreneur Canada. Thank you so much. Well, next I'd like to introduce Sean, so come back up here. We can't get too close or else that sound comes back. But Sean is the brainchild behind Startup School. Um, I definitely say that Sean kind of emphasizes what entrepreneurship is at Ryerson. So Sean, take it away. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for joining us at Startup School. Um, being an entrepreneur is a lot of things to a lot of people. To me, it's about addressing an unmet market need. Five years ago, when I joined Ryerson, we were using content in our class that I wasn't satisfied with. We were using a and &E biography, we were using uh, the Ben and Jerry story, uh, Home Depot, Sam Walton. And the problem I had was it wasn't reflective of the true diversity of our student body. We weren't showing Canadian role models. Well, like most entrepreneurs, if it's going to be, it's up to me. So we found this unmet need and turned it into an opportunity. Working with Ryerson's radio and television faculty, we developed the uniquely named Naked Entrepreneur, which I'd ask you not to Google, because it gets something totally different. Um, thus, it's awkwardly named. Um, but the Naked Entrepreneur was really, because we're in Toronto, we have access to these great founders. Can we record it? Can we push it out? Can we help people at Trent and UVic and McGill and Western have access to some of the great resources that we bring here? Little did we know that the students at the radio and television uh, faculty would do so well that in its fourth season, Oprah Winfrey picked up the show and it's now broadcast nationally on Rogers, on the Oprah Winfrey Network, it's coming to Netflix. So in that process, we were able to find this, this problem of not having enough Canadian biographies and fill it with an opportunity. 
That's given me a great opportunity to meet wonderful founders. And each year I try to bring one back from the TV show. I try to bring one back from the TV show to come talk to the students one on one. Well, thank you for being here. Um, just by show of hands, um, who here is in the entrepreneurship program? Fantastic. Um, and who here wants to ultimately uh, see themselves starting a business? Fantastic. So we, so this is going to be like, um, this is going to be like group therapy, okay? Um, because uh, we are all kindred spirits, and I will dispel all of the nonsense that everybody uh, tries to feed you about entrepreneurship, the good and the bad. Um, but I thought probably a good place to start would be to share with you some of the things that uh, we as a company have learned over the last uh, seven years. Um, sometimes it feels like 700 years, and sometimes it feels like seven minutes. Um, it really all depends on how my day is going. Um, most people can tell how our day is going from a sales perspective, and anybody who starts a business here um, will be able to um, relate to this. this you'll, co you'll come back to this and you'll say, oh yeah, that crazy bald guy said this would happen. Um, you don't need to look at a sales report uh, to see how the business is doing. You just need to look at the mood of the founder. So if we're having a good day, I'm in a fantastic mood. And if we're having a bad day, I'm in a less than fantastic mood. Um, but the, the six things that we have always focused since the very, very beginning, and we try to remind ourselves, um, at its core, no matter what business you're in, whether you're making movies, or you're selling um, ladies apparel online, or you're opening up a donut shop, or um, a bee farm, whatever it is that you're doing, at the end of the day, there's an equation. Um, whether you like it or not, there's an equation. So the, I guess the first piece of advice for those of you who are not uh, taking a stats or accounting class is take a stats or accounting class. Um, I warned my daughter who's in um, media, um, sh she should take the course that she will hate me for recommending, which is stats. Uh, take a stats course, because no matter what you do, um, you'll probably be the smartest person in the room. Uh, because you'll be able to understand what's actually happening with your business. But at, at the core, um, when we first wrote our business plan, as you saw in the clip, we came to the conclusion we needed a million dollars to get the thing off the ground. It's a pretty long and winding story about how we actually did uh, raise the million dollars. We actually did raise the million dollars. Um, I actually made 100 phone calls uh, to raise the million bucks, but we eventually got the money. Um, and the reason people gave us money and the reason people have continued to give us money, so over the last seven years, we've raised about $90 million in venture and debt. And the reason people keep writing us checks is not, obviously, not because we're so good looking. It's because we always talk about the same thing. We always talk about the equation. What's the equation? What's the formula that underlines our business? And at the end of the day, for us, and this may be different for you, our equation was always relatively simple. Um, we needed to acquire a customer, which had a cost to it, and we wanted to evaluate over time what the return on that investment was going to be. At what point were we making money? At what point were we breaking even? Um, and is that an equation that made a lot of sense to people? And what could we do in terms of running our business to optimize that equation? How would we get a little bit more margin out of each order? How do we get a little bit more volume um, out of each customer? How do we reduce the cost of acquiring each incremental customer? So everything that we did um, was always focused on understanding that equation. And every time we needed either money or uh, justification uh, to move forward and make an investment, we could always go back to that single equation. And to me, um, that was the foundation of our, ex our business model when we started. And even till today, seven years later, um, I just had a senior management meeting uh, yesterday in Montreal with all my VPs, and the equation starts every meeting. It's on the board, and we talk about how everything that we're doing 
even the way we prioritize what we're going to do this week or this month or this quarter, goes back to optimizing against that equation. Are we getting closer or further away from what that equation is supposed to be? Well, you can't manage an equation if you're not measuring. So the bottom line is you need to measure everything. I don't know if you guys saw Moneyball. Uh, everybody talked about Brad Pitt. I talked about the fat quant guy. Um, he's my favorite guy uh, because he, knew, he knows what's going on. So, you know, the Billy Bean story, um, Billy Bean revolutionized the way they managed baseball teams because rather than having a bunch of old guys sitting around a desk all trying to figure out who the best baseball player was, um, they brought in a statistician. And the statistician said, no, we don't need to get this guy. We needed this guy because this is what's missing in our equation for victory. And so he built the most successful baseball team with the lowest budget. So measuring and quantitative analysis applies not only to business, but sports and other walks of life as well. Um, our head of analytics has a very famous equation, uh, um, expression that I'm sure he stole from somebody. Um, but he always says that the bottom line is if you're not testing, you're guessing. The reality is in our business, um, just to give you a, a sense of scale, Every single day, we put 8,000 new products on our website. So we don't buy inventory, but instead what we do is we put all of these digital assets. So we're taking 10,000 pictures in our studios, and we have people writing copy, and loading all this inventory onto our website to sell it. Um, my buyers, so I have a, I've got 13 buyers. Each one buys a specific category. So I have a buyer who buys shoes and menswear and accessories and all of these different categories. They know that I am the worst, well, Sarah will tell you I'm the worst dresser, but um, I also, I have no intuition whatsoever. So when I, when I try to figure out in advance, based on my own intuition, what's going to be a good event or a good product versus not, my batting average is very, very low. In fact, they hate when I like something because it usually means it's going to be a dog. So when, I, when the buyers see me coming, they scurry. They don't want me commenting on their events, particularly events that they have a lot of faith in. Because if I like it, it, it pretty much is the, the, the kiss of death. Uh, Thomas Edison, very famous inventor um, and entrepreneur, um, when he was asked about the process he went to inventing the light bulb, probably his most famous invention, um, he said that um, he didn't fail. He, he iterated 10,000 times. He tried 10,000 different ways, and each one of the ones leading up to the time he got it right was technically a failure. He got it wrong 10,000 times. So if you think about that in, in building a business, if you think about that in any process in building the business, not only going to market, but you're going for a loan, or you're going to meet an investor. I guarantee you the first time you try it, you're not going to be very good. Think about the best person you know who plays piano, a concert pianist, or the best hockey player that you know, or the best basketball player you know. Um, they were probably not very good the first time they tried. But they persisted, and through failure they got better and better and better. The reason we were able to raise capital to start our business at the beginning wasn't because our pitch was so good. In fact, the first few times we pitched it, it was pretty horrible. And most of the questions that people asked us, we didn't have the answers for. We looked pretty silly. The reality is, by the 10th time, we knew about 80% of the questions people were going to ask, because most people asked the same questions. So the reality was the process of failing made us better because we were better prepared, we kind of looked better, we got our riff down. Um, it's just like practicing for anything else. Practicing your pitch, going into the market and realizing what doesn't work. Um, we have a, a concept in our business about failing fast, uh, but failing small. Um, it's okay not to get something right. Um, in baseball, if you hit safely 30% of the time, like I'm sure Sean may not agree, but um, if you get a 30 on your exam here, um, I, don't, I don't think you're going to make the dean's list. But if you get a 30 in baseball, you go to the Hall of Fame. 
I can tell you, if you get a 30 as an entrepreneur, you're going to do just fine. Um, our hit ratio in raising our, raising our first uh, round was 3%. Um, we spoke to 100 people over the course of nine months, and three people invested. Um, they were the, not the last three, but in the last 20, we were getting a lot better, and our ratio was getting better. But persistence really is, is in my mind, the key. Uh, Albert Einstein said that uh, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with problems longer. Uh, my dad, um, God rest his soul, was... Uh, he was kind of like a renaissance man. He, he was a poet and a mathematician, if you can imagine um, the kind of house I grew up in. Um, but uh, he had an expression. Um, it's a Yiddish word. I guess it's a, it's a German word. It's called zitzfleisch. Um, so zitz means to sit, and fleisch means meat. It basically means sitting on your ass. And so my dad's idea of learning was basically sitting until you figured it out. Um, and he didn't think that there was any other way to solve a problem but just continuing to run into the wall until you found the spark. Um, but it's all about persisting and trying it over and over and over again. And don't be scared to do that. Um, and try to find somebody who can kind of be in your corner, who can encourage you. Because it can get pretty radically bad and, and uh, discouraging if you don't have somebody rubbing your shoulders and telling you that um, there is something on the other side of the rainbow. Um, you'll probably get it in environments like this, but don't hesitate to go to other entrepreneurship uh, events. There's a bunch that I go to in Montreal. I've been to ones in Ottawa and um, across the, the country. And I was kind of joking, but not really joking, about forums like this really are like group therapy because it's a hard road um, and you're going to meet, you're, you're going to go through more failure and disappointment and frustration than anything else. Um, but you got to see your way through it and kind of the best way to do that is to commiserate with other people who are trying to do the same thing. Um, Babe Ruth, um, you know, obviously one of the best baseball players that ever lived, uh, talked about championships and um, talked about the concept of team. And I'll read the quote. He said, uh, the way a team plays as a whole determines its success. You may have the greatest bunch of individual stars in the world, but if they don't play together, the club won't be worth a dime. Um, that's the key to coaching. And as your business starts to grow, you'll realize that your role as a founder and as a CEO becomes more as a mentor and a coach uh, than it is actually as a doer. Um, in the early stages, you will do everything with your partner and your early employees, and those are really fun, amazing days. But you will, if your business is at all successful, even once you kind of get up to five or ten employees, find that most of your time is in building the team. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to bring in a bunch of high-priced talent um, with long resumes. My experience is it's way more about attitude than it is about aptitude or experience. Um, my company today uh, is being run, I think the average age of a vice president beyond the rack is 27. So most of them started in entry level positions in the company. Um, our head of marketing, so our VP marketing, who is now globally known as an expert in internet marketing, um, started with us at 23 years old um, his last job, well, he was essentially unemployable. He was selling snowboards on eBay, used snowboards on eBay. Um, and he started as a marketing coordinator. Um, our head of merchandising, who runs a team of 13 buyers across three countries, started answering the phones in customer service. So she was a, she graduated um, LaSalle College um, with a degree in fashion marketing wanted a job, started answering the phones, and then became an assistant buyer and moved her way through. Um, it's really my experience. It's, it's about attitude and aptitude. And um, the caliber of the people that you surround yourself with is mission critical. I would venture to say that the leaders in my team 
um, are as devoted to the success of the business as I am. Um, and it has nothing to do with pay grade, it has nothing to do with equity, but it's all about attitude. Um, the most um, important lesson that I've learned, and it's, a, it's been a big lesson that I've learned over the last six years, um, is if I had the choice between a rock star genius with a bad attitude and a person of average to above average capability, but a rock star attitude and commitment and devotion, I would take the second person any time. A, a thousand times out of a thousand, that's the right call. Um, and you can't make the call too quickly. Um, somebody with a bad attitude is going to bring everybody around them down, and somebody with a good attitude is going to make everybody around them better. And um, I'm a big hockey fan. Um, my, my favorite team is the Montreal Canadiens. And, <coughs> sorry about that. <laughs> with the exception of our goalie, we really don't have too many stars on that team. But th the guys really work. They work every single shift. And you want that in your business. And you want to identify that as a trait. Um, you want people who work every single shift. Um, you want people who work as hard as or harder than you do. Um, Walt Disney said, dream big. If you can dream it, you can do it. Um, I believe it. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything that you dream of is uh, necessarily going to come true. But don't be held back. Don't be held back by what other people tell you is real or not. Um, the, most, the most consistent feedback we had about Beyond the Rack when we tried to get it going at the beginning was that's a stupid idea. Or, that's not a bad idea, but you guys don't look like you're capable of doing it. Um, there were a million reasons why people sitting on the sidelines um, who are not entrepreneurs um, thought or believed that it was not going to be successful. The reality was I had four businesses before that were not particularly successful, so uh, I guess, you know, they probably were justified in thinking that. But I would just ignore all the naysayers. Um, if you have a dream, then you can make it happen. Um, and you really have to follow that dream and surround yourself as much as you can with people who share that uh, and people who are willing to support you. It's mission critical. Um, try to distance yourself from the naysayers. Um, you'll probably end up employing them one day. Um, this is really something that I like to think about a lot. If people don't laugh at your dreams, then maybe your dreams aren't big enough. It's okay to, to dream big um, and um, to pursue those dreams uh, because it's the only way that you're going to achieve them. Thank you for you guys' time, and I think we're going to sit down and take some questions. I wanted to pick up this idea of dreams and, uh, and Walt Disney. Theodore Herzl said, if you will it, it is not a dream. What role does willpower have in the entrepreneur's life? Well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty profound. One of my um, heroes, one of my entrepreneurial heroes when I was, uh, I guess, going through school um, was a guy, I don't know if you guys will know him all that well. I don't know if he's well that well known in English Canada, but his name is Jean Coutu. Okay, he's, um, he's, he was a pharmacist, okay? And he owned this small little pharmacy in Montreal uh, in the 60s. Um, and he had this idea that a pharmacy, so back in the 60s, a pharmacy was exactly that. It was a place you walked in and you gave them your prescription and then the guy behind the counter basically mixed up your medicine and you went home. And he, said, he thought that a pharmacy could be much more than this. Um, so if you think what a shopper's drug mart is today, or a Walgreens, that was, he was the first guy to think that a pharmacy could actually be a general merchant. Um, and um, I had the, and so he pursued that vision and almost went bankrupt three times. I like mortgaged his house, then borrowed money from his, I think his wife's parents. Um, like it wasn't going. And then it finally took off and then everybody else uh, copied him, but um, he built this no global chain of, of pharmacies, and I, I had the distinct um, 
pleasure of sitting on a panel with him when they were celebrating the year of the entrepreneur two years ago. And he talked about willpower. And um, it was interesting because he talked about entrepreneurs as optimists. And he said, you kind of know you're an entrepreneur um, if you always think things are going to turn out right. You know, um, an entrepreneur, if you put an entrepreneur in a dark room um, with no lights and you put him on a stage and he starts walking around to try to find his way out of the room, as soon as he bumps into the first thing, the entrepreneur is going to start thinking about, wow, well, okay, that was, a, that was a momentary setback and the pain in my knee will soon subside and I'll figure my way around this. I'll figure my way over this, around this. Then he falls off the stage and he bumps his head and he gets up and now his, 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 his eye is all swollen. But he will continue and eventually he will stumble his way out, out of the room. Um, because he always believes that um, at the end of the day, if there's an obstacle there, by the time he gets to the obstacle, he will magically disappear or by repeatedly bumping into it, it, it will fall down and he will find his way through it. I think at the end of the day, you have to be kind of immune to pain. Um, but also, you, you have to kind of be optimistic that, that um, things are going to turn out right in the end. Well, Jessica Lively, who founded uh, Kiva.org, one of the first crowdfunding kind of things, she said the entrepreneurs are always those who think tomorrow can be better than today. And that's why they start their business to fill that unmet market need, to change the world a little bit today or tomorrow. After seven years, how do you think you changed the world? Do people have better fashion? They have cheaper fashion, that's oh, okay. for sure. Um, you know, I, I think um, I measure my, my accomplishments in, in very modest terms. And I know this may sound corny, but it's, it's really sincere. Um, so when we first started the business, we were in, a, in an office. Rob and I shared an office not much bigger than the space occupied by these two chairs. You shared a desk, didn't you? Yeah, we should, we, unfortunately, we had to stare at each other all day. You had two chairs, though. Yeah, so if, if there was ever, ever motivation to succeed, um, his was that he wouldn't have to stare at me, and mine was that I wouldn't have to stare at him. Um, so today we're in this very beautiful building that was originally um, occupied by Aldo. It was his first building. Um, so Aldo is now our landlord. And it's this beautiful 300,000 square foot facility in Montreal. And every single day when I park, um, I see, I don't know, 250 cars in the parking lot. And it, it, it strikes me that there are all of these families, both in Montreal at our headquarters, we have an office here in Toronto, we have a facility in Las Vegas that employs 60 people. We have a facility in Davao City in the Philippines that employs 100 people. We have an office in New York that employs 11. To me, that's a, for a kid who grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, um, that's a, and with an English degree, so I didn't go to business school. <laughs> um, you know, I thought I'd be writing novels for the rest of my life. Um, to, um, to, to support, the, that number of families to be part of a community like that, I don't take that lightly. And I think I encourage everybody who's kind of part of our network, who's, who's part of um, the fabric that is our company, to think about that when they go through their daily routine. That you have a responsibility to that person who's putting their kids through school or is paying for a mortgage. Or, you know, we all have a, resp a, a kind of a joint responsibility for each other. So to me, when you talk about accomplishments, that's a big accomplishment. And you talked a little bit about some of the ups and downs that the entrepreneur goes through. And, and I know uh, from having talked to you many times, not only is Robert your partner, but you guys are close friends, you guys have become allies. But he's only one of your key partners. Your other partner that you talk a lot about is your spouse. Yep. What role in the team sport of entrepreneurship do spouses play? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a tactical example. When I, when I, when I decided I was going to leave corporate life... Um, so you were started with, with Avon? Or so I, I, was with, I was with Avon and then I went to Saks and then I went to Fido 
Um, so I'm responsible for all those stupid dogs. Um, that was my idea. Um, and then I went to work for a small um, startup where I was on the board and then I was the chief marketing officer. And then I remember, it was 2002, and I remember walking into a board meeting um, where all the investors were there and I was supposed to give my update on the state of the business. And my update on the state of the business, this was a startup, was that this thing was going nowhere and they should probably liquidate their holdings. Um, and what motivated me to do that... It was that, a happy meeting. Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, the founder was really happy with me. Um, and I said that you should probably start by letting go of me because you don't need me because this thing's not going anywhere. Um, I, I kind of realized after that meeting, because I came home and my wife Natalie, we had two kids at the time. Three, three sorry, thanks. Sir. I always forget what it is about. Um, three kids at the time. So it's a, it's a pretty ballsy thing to do, to tell not your boss, but your boss's uh, financial backers that they're wasting their money paying you um, without the safety net, which I didn't really have at the time. Um, and I came home and I, my wife said, so what's next? And I said, well, I think I'd like to take our life savings um, and start a business. There's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of things <clears throat> that a wife could say to a husband who's newly unemployed um, that wants to do that as the next step with three kids. Um, and um, she said, look, I support, I support you and I support your dream, um, but we have to have, um, we have to have an agreement. Um, and the agreement is, you can do this for X period of time, but if it gets to the point where we're not going to make it, um, you have to cry uncle, so we had our safety word. Um, and, um, sorry about that reference, Sarah. Um, and we're going to, you know, and then you're gonna go look for a job and you're gonna, you know, try to gainfully supply, uh, um, support us. And so that was the tacit agreement. And over the, so that was 2000 and, um, two. Um, so over the last 13 years, I've gone back to work two and a half times because two times for real, one half you were faking. One, I was kind of starting a business and consulting at the same time to kind of make ends meet. Um, but it's been a rocky road. Um, well, and isn't it true that she once called you on a road trip to tell you that they were coming to shut off the gas? The well, I have many of those, so, oh, uh, yeah, cut off the gas, um, they turned off all our electricity, um, the best one was, um, well, not the best one, the worst one, um, I don't know who she had in the car, but she was driving from one place to another in the minivan with, I think, two of our kids strapped into car seats. It wasn't you, was it? And so she gets pulled over. Not, not anything I did. She was speeding, so let's just <laughs> say what happened. So the cop pulls her over and realizes that her dumbass husband hasn't paid the license or registration because the dumbass husband was busy paying the hydro bill or <laughs> the gas bill or whatever, the other. whatever else I was juggling um, at the time. So um, they, the, the cop said, I'm impounding the car. That was not a good phone call. Um, so it, it's, been, it's been rocky. Um, so what role do you think she plays in your success? Um, the, I will tell you that without a doubt, um, I couldn't have achieved anything that I have achieved without her unbridled support because you can't fight a war, and it's a war, and it's a battle. You can't fight a war on two fronts. Um, you know, that, that you can't be in the business world fighting and fighting at home. It's really tough. I mean, you need to know that somebody's got your back and that um, somebody supports you um, despite all outward signs that you are failing. Um, you need somebody who's in your corner, who tells you that you're smarter than you are, and, you know, I saw this growing up, 
There are times where you need um, a shoulder to cry on and a pillow to scream into and a friendly face that says, I support you um, and I'm willing to take this roller coaster ride with you. Um, and sometimes you just need a swift kick in the ass and you need a wake up call. Um, and um, I've been blessed in my life to have a partner um, in, in my life, my wife Natalie, that has given me the best business advice because she's got a very clear head, um, but also motivates me, encourages me. Um, you can't do it alone. Um, it, like I said, you can't fight a, a war on two, two fronts. So you need an ally and I've, I've been blessed. If my wife said, no, we have to, um, we have to go for the, the, we have to take the easy road. It's not easy. Corporate life is not easy either. But we have to take the safe route. Um, there's no way I could have done this on my own. Because it's not like this. It's like this. And the dips are, are difficult. And the only way you get through them is um, with a, a comrade in arms. Now, you're very upfront about your failures, and our students often come to complain, but ask to learn more about the failures because we tend to present success. We have a success bias, if you will. You don't see a lot of DVDs on the biography of someone you've never heard of. So by definition, we're a failure. It's true if you think about it, but by definition, we don't get people to be honest about it. So they say it's always darkest before the dawn, but it's also always darkest right before you die. So when you've already failed four times, how do you know the fifth is going to be the winner? You don't. I mean, when we started Beyond the Rack, to be quite frank, we didn't think it was the best idea we ever had. But it didn't work out. Well, we, first four, well we, thought, we thought the Mary-Kate and Ashley phone cases were a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> we really did. I thought that was a great idea. Um, um, we thought this was a good idea. We thought it had an opportunity. Um, and we thought it was good enough that we would see it through. And when Rob and I started the business, we gave ourselves 12 months. We figured that within 12 months, we would know whether or not we had um, a success on our hands. Um, and we were fortunate um, when we raised our first round that we did it with an angel investor um, who'd kind of been through the process before. And he actually had a very different perspective. He said, we'll know in three months. Um, and he's already done this business model in other countries. He'd done it. In, other countries and he, he'd launched so many businesses as an entrepreneur and he'd also funded so many as an angel that he knew that the purpose of a seed round was not to get a business from A to Z. He realized that the entire purpose of a seed round was to prove, you know, to go back to my slides, to prove the business metrics. He said if we, if we took all of our money that we raised, the million dollars, and the only thing that we did was prove the viability of the underlying business metrics, then we could raise another round that will help us fund growth. And so he was by right. business metrics you're talking about the ability to acquire customers for At cheap, a, exactly. the ability to milk customers for a long enough but lifetime value. Lifetime value, a sell product at a, certain, um, at a certain margin and generate a certain uh, gross margin per order and so on and so forth. Yeah. One of the big problems that a lot of people have is they're still living in the 20th century of ready, aim, fire. Write a business plan, raise the money, launch the business. And yet in the 21st century, it's all about this experiment and iterate and pivot. And don't try to be right on version one, just try to be out there. Where do you go to find those first customers? I mean, you, you now have a huge customer base, but it has to start somewhere. What did you mentally do to think of where those first 100 users were gonna come from? Um. You know, I use an analogy in my own personal life. Um, there are benefits in growing up poor. Um, you learn a lot because you pretty much have to do everything yourself. So the reason I know how to change a faucet or fix uh, you know, a light switch um, or change a tire is because, well, we didn't have a car, so I didn't have to change a tire, but changed plenty of faucets in my life because we couldn't afford plumbers. Um, and the same is true when you start a business with very little capital. Um, we had to kind of figure out a way to do things on the cheap. Um, so at the beginning, 
Because we didn't have money to spend on things like Google or Facebook or big ad campaigns, um, we tried to find customers. Today they call it social networking. Um, you know, back then they called it stalking. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and we did a lot of it. I mean, we went to we tried to approach people who we felt had audiences or followers that we'd be prepared to speak on our behalf to their customer bases. And that actually worked. And it actually proved to be quite scalable. So, you know, back in, back when were we starting, in 2008, 2009, you know, we just went, we, we made a list um, of the top 500 bloggers, not necessarily fashion bloggers, but bloggers who were on things like WordPress at the time, and um, who, spoke to women of a certain age, right? So, so women age, persona. yeah, so we said, okay, our target customer is probably 25 to 45, you know, what else is she doing, you know? So she's probably traveling, so let's talk to travel bloggers. She's probably going out for dinner, we'll talk to people who speak about restaurants. She obviously likes to shop, so we'll talk to fashion and shopping bloggers. And um, we kind of bribed them, you know, so we offered them, Every customer you bring us will give you this, and we'll do a special offer to your customers. Incentive-based customer acquisition. That's what bribing. they guess, Yeah, I guess that's what they Yeah, bribing. And it worked, and that's how we built our early customer base. And those customers actually, because they came through channels that, that were um, really recommendations, they, they proved to be very, very highly valuable. So people were already taking their advice, and now they're taking People their trusted advice. them. So we borrowed, we, we borrowed that trust, and it worked really well. And you have five children, one of which is at Ryerson. Eventually, they're all going to get into the workforce in one way or another. Corporate, startup, family business, what, 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 what's your advice? Um, I'm going to ask her next. So Look, I have, a, I have a bias, having spent 20 years in corporate. Um, I encourage, if you haven't read it, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Is that the name of the book? I think that's what it's called. It's a great read. It's really easy. You know, you could do it in a weekend. Um, that's, I think those are really good rules to live by. Um, if there's a business that you're interested in, it doesn't matter what the business is, but if there's a business that you're interested in, it's not a bad idea to learn that business on someone else's dime. So going to work is probably a good idea because, you know, going to work, look at it as a learning experience. Um, if you want to own a restaurant or a catering business, go work in a restaurant um, and learn that business from the ground up. Observe the entrepreneur, observe how the business is run, ask a lot of questions, figure out how they make money, where do they lose money. Um, I had a boss once who told me it's as important to learn um, what not to do as it is what to do. Those could be really tough lessons um, on your own dime especially if you're funding it and you're trying to pay the rent and you know, go to Loblaws and stuff like that. So those are much easier lessons to learn kind of on someone else's dime. And at the appropriate time, um, I don't know, two, three years, four years, what, you'll figure it out on your own. Um, strike out on your own. You'll also have um, some life skills and you'll have some credibility with people who may either want to go into business with you, you'll know who the vendors are, You'll understand who the customer is. Um, you'll learn what to do and what not to do. So I think a hybrid is not necessarily bad. But I think if you long term want to pursue a dream, and long term you want to build the degree of freedom, both emotional and financial, it's kind of hard to do it in this country and in the United States, in most countries, as an employee. It's really tough to build equity and build wealth long term. I think it's, it's a really great training ground. I mean, you're getting an amazing background here. I'm not suggesting don't follow your dreams and start a business tomorrow. If you want to do that, you have, certainly have my blessing. Um, but there's nothing wrong with spending a few years kind of learning your trade um, and learning the business that you want to get into. So if you um, want to revolutionize the food business, go work at Law Clause. If you want that's to a really learn problem. tax evasion, go work for the IRS. Right, exactly. You want to, you want to, whatever you want to get into, learn from the best. 
and, and um, you can evolve from there. I think a hybrid is a really good idea, but I would always encourage my kids, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a business, you know. Um, you can be a film producer, and that's also an entrepreneur. You can, you can be a recording artist, and that's also an, an entrepreneur. You can be an entrepreneur in many different pursuits, you know. I think a, a class, you know, there's, I don't think there's any day anymore today, and I think that's a good thing, a classic definition of what entrepreneurship is. You know, you can be a farmer and an entrepreneur. There's a great farmer in Montreal who's one of the best entrepreneurs I know. Um, his name is Mohammed Hodge, and he started this company, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called Lufa Farms. So he builds organic hydroponic farms on the rooftops of old buildings. And he's got a $20 million business in Montreal selling organic uh, vegetables that he delivers to people and he grows them on rooftops. And he's taking it to the US and he's taking it to China. But this is a guy, he's a botanist. But he's an entrepreneur because he said, you know, Strong filled fruit is the future. Here, yeah, urban grown fruit is the future, yeah. You talked a little bit in your presentation about, about you know, six lessons you learned and you just mentioned about things to do. But you also mentioned about things not to do. So I, I want to open it up to the room. If you want a question, please come on down. But in the meantime, uh, what kind of things do you see young graduates doing that you wish they weren't? Um, there are no venture capitalists in the room, are there? <coughs> It doesn't look like it, because usually you're a venture. If you're an angel investor, I'm not going to put you in that, in that bucket. Um, <laughs> follow your own dreams and don't give away your company to investors. I mean, I think there's, there's a, there's a, there, there are too many examples of businesses that became huge successes where the entrepreneurs ended up walking away with nothing. Uh, because you know that, the, it, the, I guess the best scene from a movie I could think of is Little Mermaid. What's the sea witch? What's her name? Ursula. Ursula, yeah. You know where, where she sells her voice to Ursula to get legs to go see Eric the Prince? Well, the, the, a lot of venture capitalists are like Ursula. <laughs> they convince you that there's this dream, and you read TechCrunch and you read all for anybody who wants to go into tech. You know, they, they sell you this dream about valuation and da 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 da, and that's the way it's done, and it's it's all bullshit. Um, because my experience is, it's better to sell a ten million dollar business that you own than a five hundred million dollar business that you don't own. Um, and there's a lot of guys who sold five hundred million dollar businesses that walked away with zero, and it sounds astonishing, but it's true. And it's a pet. It's a pet peeve. One of the best examples are uh, Stuart Garfield and, and uh, Christina Fay, uh, Christina Fay, uh, who founded Flickr. Mm -hmm. They turned down all of these fees and sold it to YouTube for thirty million. Yep. But they kept more than fifty percent of the thirty million. Whereas if they had taken the VC offers, they would have had to sell it for three hundred million. Right. Exactly. Million. Just and the, they wouldn't be any farther ahead. Just the, exactly. Um, and that works to the advantage. I, it's it's a it's a myth that. Is, continues to be propagated. It's one of my pet peeves with the venture industry, but that's a, that's a different story. But, you know, I think the most important thing is persist and don't listen to the naysayers. And I, I hear so many people say, oh, I went to see a mentor or I meant to see somebody else who's already in that business and they told me the thousand reasons why my idea was stupid. Well, that's not a, don't let that dissuade you. You know, if that person was so smart, then they'd be doing it too. Um, and if you don't get it right the first time, but, you know, Facebook started as a, as a you know, as a kind of like a, a rating site for people on campus. And um, Twitter started as, I can't remember what, but something, it wasn't Twitter. It went through two iterations before it became Twitter. And a good friend of mine in Ottawa, um, who you should get on your show, I don't know if he's been on your show, Harley Finkelstein. So Harley from, from Shopify. So uh, they just went public and their company's worth like two and a half or three billion dollars. And Harley's a great guy and he started selling ski equipment. And they realized that there was no money in selling ski equipment, but there was money in selling the platform 
to sell ski equipment and now I don't know like 30,000 e-stores use his platform so it's funny what you might discover along the way about what's really cool in your business look the company that I started my career with is Avon I mean there's no older company than that and Avon you know so yeah but it, the story behind Avon is really interesting it was actually a Bible company in the late 1800s and they hired this one sales saleswoman who was selling Bibles door to door and she was giving away perfume as a as the gift with purchase and then she soon realized that more people wanted the perfume <laughs> than the Bibles so she pivoted and she built you know one of the world's biggest beauty companies so it, it's funny what you might find out along the way What's the one thing you're most surprised that you learned along the way? I guess the thing that um, most surprised me was that um, you should you should trust uh, attitude over aptitude. Um, it's another thing that VCs will try to convince you of, is that you need to hire a bunch of expensive people who have long resumes um, that are smarter than you and better than you and know, know everything. Um, it's amazing the talent pool that you'll find in your midst. In your midst. And it's amazing, like I don't know too many people who were born as VPs of marketing. Like they don't come out of the womb as VP marketing or they don't come out of the womb as, you know, heads of IT or, you know, VPs of logistics or operation. <coughs> Jeff Bezos, right? So probably the best innovator in e-commerce that we know. So he built a $70 billion company. Um, he's a astrophysicist, but he's, he's a curious guy. Um, and I think if you just trust your curiosity, um, I have a, one of my one of my investors um, uh, has this theory about happiness, and he said, you know, I've observed lots of people as they've grown older, and um, it's always been a quest of mine to figure out what makes people happy, and you know, despite you know, like poverty doesn't make people happy, certainly, but. Neither does wealth make people happy. So it's not money specifically. So he kind of boiled it down to the three things. Um, so he said, happy people are busy. So they're active and they're busy. Um, happy people are kind. Um, so he says, I, I haven't seen too many assholes who are happy. Um, so they're kind and they're generous. And happy people are curious and they remain curious throughout their lives. So if you're always looking to learn something, if you're genuinely nice to other people and generous, and you stay busy and very active, then you've got, I think that's not just a recipe for happiness, I think it's a recipe for success. To mix in those equal parts. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good, pretty good um, rules to live by. So I think I should redo my slides. <laughs> what should people look for in a partner? More of the same? Or the yin and the yin. I think it's complementary skills. You know, I think if you two people, um, you know, Steve Jobs used to talk about this. If two if, if, if two people always agree, then one of them is superfluous. So I think the if you have mutual respect and you can find a relationship where you can disagree and not kill each other, so um, that's probably a good basis for a partnership where you can disagree, where you can have a healthy debate and come to a conclusion or agree um, after a debate that one of you owns this and the other one owns that so that you'll leverage that feedback and then make um, your decisions. Um, that's kind of the, the working arrangement Rob and I have always had. Um, I, may, I may think something is, that he thinks is ludicrous or he may think that something that I believe in is ludicrous. Um, if I feel that after a debate I can convince him, then I know we're probably better off. And usually the idea will have evolved. 
because he will have countered most well, of the dynamic them. process you grow from each other's I'm a dreamer, so I will admit I'm a big picture dreamer, everything is gonna be amazing kind of guy. And he's a pragmatist. He always sees what's going to go wrong. Um, it's good to have that in a relationship. My relationship at home is very much the same. My wife is definitely the pragmatist. So if you just have a dreamer, you'll probably end up living behind a Dunkin' Donuts. Um, so you need somebody who's going to kind of bring you back down to earth and ground you and focus you um, and make sure you do your homework uh, and brush your teeth. Um, so it's important to have that in a partnership. Now, today you have a huge customer base, you have some buying power, you have some leverage, but it wasn't always so easy. How do you, when you're in a two-sided market, you need the customers for the brands to want to share with you their assets, and you need the assets for the customers to want to show up. And it's all well and good for Martha Stewart to say you gotta fake it before you make it, but either you have inventory or you don't. How did you get past that catch 22 in the early days? Well, at the beginning we had no money to buy, so going, going into a distributor or, or wholesaler and buying their stuff wasn't viable, we didn't have any money. Um, and we tried to convince most of these guys that they would sell us on consignment. Um, selling on consignment is viable, but usually somebody wants to see some volume behind it, so we had no volume. I mean, we were selling two items a week at the beginning. So at the beginning, we did fake it. Um, we have friends who own four retail stores in Montreal, and when we first started, we would go to their store every Wednesday night. We would take everything off of their clearance rack in the back of the store. We would take it back to our little office. We would photograph it. We would write all the copy. We would bring it back by Thursday morning. And one of us would sit in the store while we sold it on the website. And every time we sold something, we would literally buy it out of retail. Um, and that must it's not, that it's, must not be that efficient, though. Did you ever sell something you didn't know? Oh, many times. Um, we had that once where, where this um, Rob was sitting in a store and this woman, um, he, like he was sitting there watching the inventory, of course, and we sell this uh, dress. It was a juicy couture dress. And so I ping Rob on his phone and he's sitting there in the store like a, like a watchdog. And, um, For that one medium yeah, dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sell, you know, buy the, buy the dress. We just sold the dress. I think we, we were selling at a loss at the time. We were just trying to prove it. And um, so Rob goes to the rack and there's no dress, of course. And all of a sudden this woman walks out of the dressing room and she's wearing the dress. And I don't know where the sales girl was, but she wasn't, she wasn't in the store. And there's Rob and he's like staring at this woman. And I don't know if you've ever been shopping either with your wife or your girlfriend. There's um, but you know, women go through this process, particularly when they're shopping for fashion, um, where they need there's a validation step, right? And so they need How to, do I look in this? Right, right, they need to ask somebody. Usually, they ask the husband who has no clue, and his answer usually is, "Oh, you look amazing," um, which is why returns are so high in retail. But if she's with her girlfriends, or if there's a, you know, a, 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 a sales a sales clerk, she'll you know. Oh, that's great, that's not so great. So, of course, she asks Rob, because there's nobody else in the store, you know, she's looking in the, in the three-way mirror, you know, and she says to Rob, like, how does, how does this look on me? So Rob goes through that, that moment that everybody goes through, you know, as an entrepreneur, where, you know, you've got the, the angel on one shoulder whispering the answer, and the devil on the other shoulder whispering the other answer, and sometimes, you have to make a, you know, a, a tough decision about what to say in a situation like that. So Rob kind of looks at her and he says, makes you look a little fat. <laughs> now he was probably doing her a favor because it probably was not a flattering cut for her uh, at the time. And she probably chose something that was probably more appropriate. Um, um, but we didn't short that particular customer. I think we were so, we were so scared at the beginning that any, any error that we made um, was gonna, that was it, that was gonna cause the business to, to fail, right? Um, and you realize in retrospect, you know, 
today, you know, I think back to that story, and today, um, through no fault of their own, because we're selling out of our vendor's inventory, we short ship 3%. So three out of every 100 items. Or, you know, you think on every day we ship about 10,000 pieces, right? So that's 300 pieces a day that we're short shipping every single day. And, you know, at the beginning we were scared that if we short shipped one, they short were, shipping to you, yeah, you sold something in your that life. we're never going to fulfill it and we're going to have to refund the customer, that that would be the death knell to the business. You start to realize, you know, there is a mar there's a margin of error and, you know, every, every problem is not a calamity and it's not a crisis. And, um, but it's so funny, like, we think back to those early days and every little thing we thought was going to end, was going to end it for us. Now, we don't have to end tonight, but we do have to wrap up. I've been given a, a very precious award from the, our friends at Futurepreneur. It's the lapel pin that proves that you are an entrepreneur. Oh, fantastic. Just in case the, the scars and the loss of your hair yeah. weren't enough. Ladies and gentlemen, from beyond the rack, Mr. Jonas Stern. Thank you very much. Thank you.